Crime and Punishment, Part One, Chapter Five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett, Part One. Chapter 5 Of course, I've been meaning lately to go to Razumihin's to ask for work, to ask him to get me lessons or something, as Kalnik afford. But what a help can he be to me now? Suppose he gets me lessons, suppose he shares his last farthings with me, if he has any farthings, so that I could get some boots and make myself tidy enough to give lessons. Hmm. Well, and what then? What shall I do with the few coppers I earn? That's not what I want now. It's really absurd for me to go to Razumihin. The question why he was going to Razumihin agitated him even more than he was himself aware. He kept uneasily seeking for some sinister significance in this apparently ordinary action. Could I have expected to set it all straight, and to find a way out by means of Razumihin alone? He asked himself, in perplexity. He pondered and rubbed his head, and strange to say, after long musing suddenly, as if it were spontaneously, and by chance, a fantastic thought came into his head. Hmm, to Razumihin's, he said all at once, calmly, as though he had reached a final destination. I shall go to Razumihin's, of course, but not now. I shall go to him on the next day after it, when it will be over and everything will begin afresh. And suddenly he realized that he was thinking. After it, he shouted, jumping up from the seat, but is it really going to happen? Is it possible it really will happen? He left the seat and went off almost at a run. He meant to turn back homewards, but the thought of going home suddenly filled him with intense loathing, and that hall, and that awful little cupboard of his, all this had for a month past been growing up in him, and he walked on at random. His nervous shudder had passed into a fever that made him feel shivering, in spite of the heat he felt cold. With a kind of effort, he began almost unconsciously, from some inner craving, to stare at all the objects before him, as though looking for something to distract his attention. But he did not succeed. He kept dropping every moment into brooding, when with a start he lifted his head again and looked round, he forgot at once what he had just been thinking about, and even where he was going. And this way, he walked right across Vasilevsky Ostrov, came out onto the Lesser Neva, crossed the bridge, and turned towards the islands, the greenness and freshness were at first restful to his weary eyes after the dust of the town and the huge houses that hemmed him in and waited upon him. Here there were in here there were no taverns, no stifling closeness, no stench. But soon these new pleasant sensations passed into the morbid irritability Sometimes he stood still before a brightly painted summer villa standing along green foliage. 
He gazed through the ferns. He saw in the distance smartly dressed women on the verandas and balconies, and children running in the gardens. The flowers especially caught his attention. He gazed at them longer than at anything. He was met too by luxurious carriages and by men and women on horseback. He watched them with curious eyes and forgot about them before they had vanished from his sight. Once he stood still and counted his money, he found he had thirty kopecks, twenty to the policeman, three to Nastasia for the letter, so I must have given forty-seven or fifty to Marmaladov's yesterday, he thought, reckoning it up for some unknown reason. But he soon forgot the what object he had taken the money out of his pocket. He recalled it on passing an eating house or tavern, and felt that he was hungry. Going into the tavern, he drank a glass of vodka and ate a pie of some sort. He finished eating it as he walked away. It was a long while since he had taken vodka. And it had an effect upon him at once, though he only drank a wine glassful. His legs fell suddenly heavy, and a great drowsiness came upon him. He turned homewards, but reaching Petrovsky Ostrov, he stopped completely exhausted, turned off the road into the bushes, sank down upon the grass, and instantly fell asleep. In a morbid condition of the brain, dreams often have the singular actuality, vividness, and extraordinary semblance of reality. At times, monstrous images are created, but the setting, the whole pictures are so toothlike and filled with details, so delicate, so unexpectedly. But so artistically consistent that the dreamer, were he an artist like Pushkin or Turgenev even, could never have invented them in the waking state. Such sick dreams always remain long in the memory, and make a powerful impression on the over rough and deranged nervous system. Raskolnikov had a fearful dream. He dreamt. He was back in his childhood in the little town of his birth. He was a child about seven years old, walking into the country with his father on the evening of a holiday. It was a grey and heavy day. The country was exactly as he remembered it. Indeed, he recalled it far more vividly in his dream than he had done in memory. The little town stood on a level flat, as bare as the hand. Not even a willow near it. Only in the far distance, a corpse lay, a dark blur on the very edge of the horizon. A few paces beyond the last market garden stood a tavern, a big tavern, which had always aroused in him a feeling of aversion, even of fear. When he walked by with his father, there was always a crowd there, always shouting, laughter and abuse, hideous horse singing, and often fighting. Drunken and horrible-looking figures were hanging about the tavern. He used to cling close to his father, trembling all over when he met them. Near the tavern, the road became a dusty track, the dust of which was always black. It was a winding road, and about a hundred paces further on, it turned to the right, to the graveyard. In the middle of the graveyard stood a stone church, with the green cupola, where he used to go to mass two or three times a year. With his father and mother, when a service was held in memory of his grandmother, who had long been dead and whom he had never seen. On these occasions, 
they used to take on a white dish tied up in a table napkin, a special sort of rice pudding with raisins stuck in it and in the shape of the cross. He loved their church, the old-fashioned unadorned icons and the old priest with the shaken head. Near his grandmother's grave, which was marked by a stone, was the little grave of his younger brother, who had died at six months old. He did not remember him at all, but he had been told about his little brother, and whenever he visited the graveyard, he used religiously and reverently to cross himself and to bow down and the kiss the little grave. And now he dreamt that he was walking with his father past the town on the way to the graveyard. He was holding his father's hand and looking with dread at the town. A peculiar circumstance attracted his attention. There seemed to be some kind of festivity going on. There were crowds of gaily dressed townspeople, peasant women, their husbands, and riffraff of all sorts, all singing and all more or less drunk. Near the entrance of the tavern stood a cart, but a strange cart. It was only one of those big carts usually drawn by heavy cart horses and laden with casks of wine or other heavy goods. He always liked looking at those great cart horses with their long manes, thick legs and slow even pace drawing along a perfect mountain with no appearance of effort as though it were easier going with a load than without it. But now, strange to say, in the shafts of such a cart he saw a thin little sorrel paste, one of those peasant snags which he had often seen straining their utmost under a heavy load of wood or hay, especially when the wheels were stuck in the mud or in a rut, and the peasants would beat them so cruelly, sometimes even about the nose and eyes, and he felt so sorry, so sorry for them, that he almost cried, and his mother always used to take him away from the window. All of a sudden there was a great uproar of shouting, singing, and the balalaika, and from the tavern a number of big and very drunken peasants came out, wearing red and blue shirts and coats thrown over their shoulders. Get in, get in, shouted one of them, a young thick-necked peasant with a fleshy face red as a carrot. I'll take you all, get in. But at once there was an outbreak of laughter and exclamations in the crowd. Take us all, with a beast like that. Why, Mikolka, are you crazy to put an egg like that in such a cart? And this may is twenty, if she's a day mate. Get in, I'll take you all, Mikolka shouted again, leaping first into the cart, seizing the reins, and standing straight up in front. The bay has gone with Matwi, he shouted from the cart, and this brute mate is just breaking my heart. I feel as if I could kill her. She's just eating her head off. Get in, I'll tell you. I'll make her gallop. She'll gallop. And he picked up the whip, preparing himself with relish to flog the little mare. Get in. Come along, the crowd laughed. Do you hear she'll gallop? Gallop indeed. She has not had a gallop in her for the last ten years. She'll duck along. Don't you mar her, mate. Bring a whip, each of you. Get ready? All right. Give it to her. They all clambered into McCulker's cart, laughing and making jokes. Six men got in, and there was still room for more. They hauled in a fat, rosy-cheeked woman. 
She was dressed in a red cotton and a pointed beaded headdress and the thick leather shoes. She was cracking nuts and laughing. The crowd round them was laughing too, and indeed, how could they help laughing? That wretched nag was to drag all the cartloads of them at a gallop. Two young fellows in a cart were just getting whips ready to help Mikalka. With the cry of now, the mare tucked with all her might, but far from galloping, could scarcely move forward. She struggled with her legs, gasping and shrinking from the blows of the three whips which were showered upon her like hail. The laughter in the cart and in the crowd was redoubled, but Mikolka flew into a rage and furiously trashed the mare, as though he supposed he really could gallop. Let me in too, mate, shouted a young man in the crowd, whose appetite was aroused. Get in, all get in, cried Mikolka. She will draw you all, I'll beat her to death. And he trashed and trashed at the mare, beside himself the fury. Father, father, he cried, father, what they are doing, father, they are beating the poor horse. Come along, come along, said his father, they are drunken and foolish, they are in fun. Come away, don't look, and he tried to draw him away. But he tore himself away from his hand, and beside himself the horror ran to the horse. The poor beast was in a bad way. She was gasping, standing still, then tugging again, and almost falling. Be her to death, cried Mikolka. It's come to that. I'll do to her. Where are you about? Are you a Christian, you devil? shouted an old man in the crowd. Did anyone ever see the like? A rich knack like that, pulling such a cartload, said another. You'll kill her, shouted the third. Don't meddle, it's my property. I'll do what I choose. Get in, more of you. Get in all of you. I will have her go at a gallop. All at once, laughter broke into a row and covered everything. The mare, roused by the shower of blows, began feebly kicking. Even the old man could not help smiling. To think of a wretched little beast like that, trying to kick. Two lads in the crowd snatched up whips and ran to the mare to beat her about the ribs. One run each side, hit her in the face, and the eyes and the eyes cried Mikalka. Give us a song, mate, shouted someone in the cart, and everyone in the cart joined in a riotous song, jingling, a tambourine, and whistling. The woman went on cracking nuts and laughing. He ran beside the mare, running in front of her, saw her being whipped across the eyes, right in the eyes. He was crying, he felt shocking, his tears were screaming. One of the men gave him a cut with the whip across the face. He did not feel it. Wringing his hands and screaming, he rushed up to the grey-headed old man with the grey beard who was shaking his head in disapproval. One woman seized him by the hand and would have taken him away but he tore himself from her and ran back to the mare. She was almost at the last gasp, but began kicking once more. I'll teach you to kick, Mikolka shouted ferociously. He threw down the whip, bent forward, and picked up from the bottom of the cart a long thick shaft. He took hold of one end with both hands and with an effort brandished it over the mare. A crush her was shouted round him. He'll kill her. It's my property, shouted Mikolka, and brought the shop down to the swinging blow. There was a sound of a heavy thud. Trash her, trash her. Why have you stopped, shouted voices in the crowd and Mikalka swung the shaft a second time, 
and it fell a second time on the spine of the luckless mare. She sank back on her haunches, but lurched forward and tucked forward with all her force, tucked thrust on one side and then on the other, trying to move the cart. But the six whips were attacking her in all directions, and the shaft was raised again and fell upon her a third time, then a fourth, with heavy measured blows. Mikalka was in a fury that he could not kill her at one blow. She's a tough one, was shouted in the crowd. She'll fall in a minute, mate. There will soon be an end of her, said an admiring spectator in the crowd. Fetch an axe to her, finish her off, shouted a third. I'll show you stand off, Mikolka screamed frantically. He threw down the shaft, stooped down in the cart, and picked up an iron crowbar. Look out! He shouted with all his might. He dealt a stunning blow at the poor mare. The blow fell. The mare staggered, sank back, tried to pull, but the bar felt again with the swinging blow on her back, and she felt on the ground like a log. Finish her off, shouted Mikolka, and he leaped beside himself out of the cart. Several young men, also flushed with drink, seized anything they could come across, whips, sticks, poles, and ran to the dying mare. Mikalka stood on one side and began dealing random blows with the crowbar. The mare stretched out on her head, drew a long breath, and died. You butchered her, someone shouted in the crowd. Why wouldn't she have it then? My property, shouted Mikolka, with her bloodshot eyes, brandishing the bar in his hands. He stood as though regretting that he had nothing more to beat. No mistake about it, you are not a Christian, many voices were shouting in the crowd. But the poor boy beside himself made his way screaming through the crowd to the sorrel nag put his arms round her bleeding dead head, and kissed it, kissed the eyes, and kissed the lips. Then he jumped up and flew in a frenzy, with his little fist at out at Mikolka. At that instant his father, who had been running after him, snatched him up and carried him out of the crowd. Come along, let us go home, he said to him. Father, why did they kill the poor horse? He sobbed, but his voice broke, and the words came in shrieks from his panting chest. They're drunk. They're brutal. It's not our business, said his father. He put his arms round his father, but he felt shocked, shocked. He tried to draw a breath, to cry out, and woke up. He waked up gasping for breath his hair soaked with perspiration, and stood up in terror. Thank God, that was only a dream, he said, sitting down under a tree and drawing deep breaths. But what is it? Is it some fever coming on? Such a hideous dream. He felt utterly broken. Darkness and confusion were in his soul. He rested his elbows on his knees and leaned his head on his hands. Good God, he cried, can it be, can it be, that I shall really take an axe, that I shall strike her on the head, split her skull open, that I shall set in the sticky warm blood, break the lock, steal and tremble, hide all splattered in the blood where the axe good god can it be he was shaking like a leaf as he said this but why am i going on like this he continued sitting up again as it were in profound amazement i knew what i could never bring myself to it so what have i been torturing myself for till now 
Yesterday, yesterday when I went to make that experiment, yesterday I realized completely what I could never bear to do it. Why am I going over it again then? Why am I hesitating? As I came down the stairs yesterday, I said to myself that it was base, loathsome, vile, vile. The very thought of it made me feel sick and filled me with horror. No, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Granted, granted that there is no flaw in all that reasoning. But all that I have concluded this last month is clear as day. Too, as arithmetic. My God, anyway, I couldn't bring myself to it. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Why? Why the am I still? He rose to his feet, looked round in wonder as though surprised at finding himself in this place, and went towards the bridge. He was pale, his eyes glowed, he was exhausted in every limb, but he seemed suddenly to breathe more easily. He felt he had cast off the fearful burden that had so long been weighing upon him, and all at once there was a sense of relief and a peace in his soul. Lord, he prayed, show me my path. I renounce the accursed dream of mine. Crossing the bridge, he gazed quietly and calmly at the neither, at the glowing red sun setting in the glowing sky. In spite of his weakness, he was not conscious of fatigue. It was as though an abscess that had been forming for a month past in his heart had suddenly broken. Freedom! Freedom! He was free from that spell, that sorcery, that obsession. Later on, when he recalled that time, and all that happened to him during those days, minute by minute, point by point, he was superstitiously impressed by one circumstance, which though in itself now not very exceptional, always seemed to him afterwards the predestined turning point of his fate. He could never understand and explain to himself why, when he was tired and worn out, when it would have been more convenient for him to go home by the shortest and most direct way, he returned by a haymarket where he had no need to go. It was obviously and quite unnecessarily out of his way, though not much so. It is true that it happened to him dozens of times to return home without noticing what streets he passed through. But why, he was always asking himself, why had such an important, such a decisive, and at the same time such an absolutely chance meeting happened in the Haymarket, where he had, moreover, no reason to go, at the very hour, the very minute of his life, when he was just in a very mood and in a very circumstances in which that meeting was able to exert the gravest and most decisive influence on his whole destiny, as though it had been lying in wait for him on purpose. It was about nine o'clock when he crossed the haymarket, at the tables and the barrows, at the booths and the shops, all the market people were closing their establishments or clearing away and packing up their wares, and like their customers were going home. Rack pickers and customongers of all kinds were crowding round the taverns in the dirty and stinking courtyards of the hay market. Raskolnikov particularly liked this place and the neighboring alleys when he wandered aimlessly in the streets. Here his rags did not attract contemptuous attention, and one could walk about in any attire without scandalizing people. 
At the corner of an alley, a huckster and his wife had two tables set out for tapes, thread, cotton handkerchiefs, etc. They too had to get up to go home, but while lingering in conversation with a friend who had just come up to them, this friend was Lizaveta Ivanovna, or, as everyone called her, Lizaveta, the younger sister of the old pawnbroker, Alyona Ivanovna, whom Raskolnikov had visited the previous day to pawn his watch and make his experiment. He already knew all about Lizaveta, and she knew him a little too. She was a single woman and about thirty-five, tall, clumsy, timid, submissive, and almost idiotic. She was a complete slave, and went in fear and trembling of her sister, who made her work day and night, and even beat her. She was standing with a bundle before a huckster and his wife, listening earnestly and doubtfully. They were talking of something with special warmth. The moment Raskolnikov caught sight of her, he was overcome by a strange sensation, as it were of intense astonishment, that there was nothing astonishing about this meeting. You could make up your mind for yourself, Lizaveta Ivanovna, the huckster was saying aloud. Come round tomorrow about seven, they will be here too. Tomorrow, said Lizaveta slowly and thoughtfully, as though unable to make up her mind. Upon my word, what a fright you are in of Aliana Ivanovna, gabbled the huckster's wife, a lively little woman. I look at you, you are like some little babe. And she is not your own sister, even nothing but a stepsister, and what a hang she keeps over you. But this time, don't say a word to Elena Ivanovna, her husband interrupted. That's my advice. But come round to us without asking. It will be worth your while. Later on, your sister herself may have the notion. Am I to come? About seven o'clock tomorrow, and they will be here. You will be able to decide for yourself. And we'll have a cup of tea, added his wife. All right, I'll come, said Lizaveta, still pondering, and she began slowly moving away. Raskolnikov had just passed and heard no more. He passed softly, unnoticed, trying not to miss a word. His first amazement was followed by a thrill of horror like a shiver running down his spine. He had learned, he had suddenly quite unexpectedly learned, that the next day at seven o'clock Lizaveta, the old woman's sister, and old companion would be away from home, and that therefore at seven o'clock precisely the old woman would be left alone. He was only a few steps from his lodging. He went in, like a man condemned to death. He thought of nothing and was incapable of thinking, but he felt suddenly in his whole being that he had no more freedom of thought, no will, and that everything was suddenly and irrevocably decided. Certainly, if he had to wait whole years for a suitable opportunity, he could not reckon on more certain steps towards the success of the plan than that which had just presented itself. In any case, it would have been difficult to find out beforehand and with certainty, with greater exactness and less risk, and without dangerous inquiries and investigations, that next day, at a certain time, an old woman on whose life an attempt was contemplated, would be at home, and entirely alone. End of Part 1 Chapter 5
is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett. Chapter 6, Part 1. Later on, Raskolnikov happened to find out why the huckster and his wife had invited to Lizaveta. It was a very ordinary matter and there was nothing exceptional about it. A family who had come to the town and been reduced to poverty were selling their household goods and clothes, all of them and things. As the things would have been fetched little in the market, they were looking for a dealer. This was Lizaveta's business. She undertook such jobs and was frequently employed as she was very honest and always fixed a fair price and stuck to it. She spoke as a rule little and, as we have said already, she was very submissive and timid. But Raskolnikov had become superstitious of late. The traces of superstition remain in him long after, and were almost ineradicable. And in all this, he was always afterwards disposed to see something strange and mysterious, as it were the presence of some peculiar influences and coincidences. In the previous winter, the student he knew called Pokorev, who had left for Kharkov, had chance in the conversation to give him the address of Alyona Ivanovna, the old pawnbroker, in case he might want to pawn anything. For a long while he did not go to her, for he had lessons and managed to get along somehow. Six weeks ago he had remembered the address he had two articles which could be pawned. His father's old silver watch and a little gold ring with the three red stones, a present from his sister at parting. He decided to take the ring. Then he found the old woman. He had felt an insurmountable repulsion for her at first glance, though he knew nothing special about her. He got two rubles from her and went into the miserable little tavern on his way home. He asked for tea, sat down, and sunk into the deep food. A strange idea was pecking at his brain, like a chicken in the egg, and that very much absorbed him. Almost beside him, at the next table, there was sitting a student whom he did not know and had never seen, and with him a young officer. They had played a game of billiards and begun drinking tea. All at once he heard the student mention to the officer the poem broke Eliana Ivanovna and give him her address. This of itself seemed strange to Raskolnikov, he had just come from her, and here at once he heard her name. Of course it was a chance, but he could not shake off a very extraordinary impression and I heard some one seemed to be speaking expressly for him. The student began telling his friend various details about Aliana Ivanovna. She is a first rate, he said. You can always get money from her. She is as rich as a Jew. She can give you five thousand rubles at the same time and she is not about taking a pledge for a ruble. Lots of our fellows have had dealings with her. But she's an awful old harpy. And he began describing how spiteful and uncertain she was, how if you were only a day late with your interest the pledge was lost, how she gave a quarter of the value of an article and took five or even seven percent a month on it, and so on. The student chattered on, saying that she had a sister Lizaveta, whom the wretch little creature was continually beating and kept in the complete bondage like a small child, though Lizaveta was at least six feet high. There is a thunderbolt for you, cried the student, and he laughed. They began talking about Lizaveta, 
The student spoke about her with a peculiar relish and was continually laughing and the officer listened with a great interest and asked him to send Lizavieta to do some mending for him. Raskolnikov did not miss a word and learned everything about her. Lizavieta was younger than the old woman and was her half-sister. Being the child of the different mother, she was thirty-five. She worked day and night for her sister, and besides doing the cooking and the washing, she did sewing and worked as a chairwoman and gave her sister all she earned. She did not dare to accept an order or job of any kind without her sister's permission. The old woman had already made her will, and Elizaveta knew of it, and by this will she would not get a farthing, nothing but the movables, chairs, and so on. All the money was left to the monastery in the province of Anne that prayers might be said for her in perpetuity. Lizavieta was of a lower rank than her sister and married an awfully uncouthen appearance, a remarkably tall with long feet that look as if they were bent outwards. She always wore better at goatskin shoes and was clean on her person. What the student expressed most surprise and amusement about was the fact that Lizavieta was continually the child. But you say she's a hideous, observed the officer. Yes, she's a dark skinned and looks like a soldier dressed up. But you know she is not at all hideous. She has such a good natural face and eyes, strikingly so. And the proof of it is that lots of people are attracted by her. She is such a soft, gentle creature, ready to put up with anything, always willing, willing to do anything, and her smile is really very sweet. You seem to find her attractive yourself, laughed the officer. From her queerness, now I'll tell you what, I could kill that damn old woman and make off with her money. I assure you, without the faintest conscious prick, the student added with warmth. The officer laughed again while Raskolnikov shuddered. How strange it was. Listen, I want to ask you a serious question, the student said hotly. I was joking, of course, but you... but look here. On the one side, we have a stupid, senseless, worthless, spiteful, ailing-hearted old woman, not simply useless, but doing actual mischief, who has not an idea what she is living for herself, and who will die in a day or two, in any case. You understand? You understand? Yes, yes, I understand, answered the officer, watching his excited companion attentively. Well, listen then, on the other side, fresh young lives thrown away for want of help, and by thousands on every side. A hundred thousand good deeds could be done and helped on that old woman's money which will be buried in a monastery. Hundreds, thousands perhaps might be set on the right path. Dozens of families saved from destitution, from ruin, from wise, from the law hospitals, and all the her money. Kill her, take her money, and with the help of it devote oneself to the service of humanity and the good of all. What do you think? Would not one tiny crime be wiped out by thousands of good deeds? Or one life thousands would be saved from corruption and decay? One death and a hundred lives in exchange? It's simple arithmetic. Besides, but thou who has the life of that sickly, stupid, ill natured old woman in the balance of existence, no more than the life of the loose, of the black beetle, less in fact, because the old woman is doing harm, she is wearing out the lives of others. The other day she bit Lizaveta's finger out of spite. It almost had to be amputated. Of course, she does not deserve to live, remarked the officer, but there it is, it's nature. 
Oh, well, brother, but we have to correct and direct nature. And, uh, but for that, we should run in an ocean of prejudice. But for that, there would never have been a single great man. They talk of duty, conscience. I don't want to say anything against duty and conscience. But the point is, what do we mean by them? Stay, I have another question to ask you. Listen. Now you stay, I'll ask you a question. Listen. Well, you are talking and speechifying away, but tell me, would you kill the old woman yourself? Of course not. I was only arguing the justice of that. It's nothing to do with me. But I think, if you would not do it yourself, there is no justice about it. Let us have another game. Raskolnikov was violently agitated. Of course, it was all ordinary youthful talk and thought, such as he had often heard before in different forms and on different themes. But why had he happened to hear such a discussion and such ideas at the very moment when his own brain was just conceiving the very same ideas? And why, just at the moment when he had brought away the embryo of his idea from the old woman, had he dropped at once upon a conversation about her? This coincidence always seemed strange to him. This trivial talk in the tavern had an immense influence on him in his later action, as both there had really been in it something preordained, some guiding hint. On returning from the hay market, he flung himself on the sofa and sat for a whole hour without stirring. Meanwhile, it got dark, he had no candle, and indeed, it did not occur to him to light up. He could never recollect whether he had been thinking about anything at that time. At last, he was conscious of his form of fever and shivering, and he realized with relief what he could lie down on the sofa. Soon, a leading sleep came over him as it were crushing him. He slept an extraordinary long time in the hall dreaming. Nastasia, coming into his room at ten o'clock the next morning, had difficulty in rousing him. She brought him in tea and bread. The tea was again the second brew, and again her own teapot. My goodness, how he sleeps! she cried indignantly. And he always asleep. He got up with an effort, his head ached, he stood up, took a turn in his garret, and sank back into the south again. Going to sleep again, cried Nastasia. Are you ill, huh? He made no reply. Do you want some tea? Afterwards, he said with an effort, closing his eyes again and turning to the wall. Nastasia stood over him. Perhaps he really is ill, she said, turned and went out. She came in again at two o'clock the soup. He was lying as before. The tea stood untouched. Nastasia fell positively offended and began wrathfully rousing him. Why are you lying like a log? She shouted, looking at him with repulsion. He got up and sat down again but said nothing and stared at the floor. Are you ill or not? asked Nastasia and again received no answer. You better go out and get a breath of air, she said after a pause. Will you eat it or not? Afterwards, he said weakly, you can go. And he motioned her out. She remained a little longer, looked at him with compassion and went out. A few minutes afterwards, he raised his eyes and looked for a long while at the tea and the soup. Then he took the bread, took up a spoon, and began to eat. He ate a little, three 
or force spoonfuls without appetite as if there mechanically his head ached less. After his meal he stretched himself on the sofa again, but now he could not sleep. He lay without stirring with his face in the pillow. He was haunted by daydreams and such strange daydreams, and one that kept recurring he fancies what he was in Africa, in Egypt, and some sort of oasis. The car one was resting, the camels were peacefully lying down, the palms stood all around in the complete circle, all the party were at dinner. But he was drinking water from a spring which floated gurgling close by, and it was so cool, it was wonderful, wonderful blue, cold water running among the party colored stones and all of the clean sand which glistened here and there like gold. Suddenly he heard the clock strike. He started, roused himself, raised his head, looked out of the window, and seeing how late it was, suddenly jumped up wide awake as though someone had pulled him off the sofa. He crept on tiptoe to the door, stealthily opened it, and began listening on the staircase. His heart beat terribly, but all was quiet on the stairs, as if everyone was asleep. It seemed to him strange and monstrous that he could have slept in such forgetfulness from the previous day, and had done nothing, had prepared nothing yet. And meanwhile, Perhaps it had struck six, and his drowsiness and stupefaction were followed by an extraordinary, feverish, as it were, distracted haste. But the preparations to be made were few. He concentrated all his energies on thinking of everything and forgetting nothing, and his heart kept beating and thumping so that he could hardly breathe. First, he had to make a noose and sew it into his old coat, a work of the moment. He rummaged under his pillow and picked out amongst the linen stuffed away under it a worn-out, old, unwatched shirt. From its rags he tore a long strip, a couple of inches wide, and about sixteen inches long. He folded the strip in two, took off his wide, strong summer overcoat of some stout cotton material, his only outer garment, and began sewing the two ends of the rag on the inside under the left armhole. His hands shook as he sewed, but he did it successfully so that nothing showed outside when he put the coat on again. The needle and thread he had got ready long before, and they lay on his table in a piece of paper. As for the news, it was a very ingenious device of his own. The news was intended for the axe. It was impossible for him to carry the axe to the streets in his hands and if hidden under his coat, he would still have had to support it with his hand, which would have been noticeable. Now, he had only to put the head of the axe in the noose, and it would hang quietly under his arm on the inside. Putting his hand in his coat pocket, he could halt the end of the handle all the way so that it did not swing and as the coat was very full, a regular sack in fact, it could not be seen from outside when he was holding something with the hand that was in the pocket. This news, too, he had designed a fortnight before. When he had finished with this, he thrust his hand into a little opening between his sofa and the floor, fumbled in the left corner, and drew out the pledge which he had got ready long before, 
and hidden there. This pledge was, however, only a smoothly planned piece of wood the size and thickness of the silver cigarette case. He picked up this piece of wood in one of his wanderings in a courtyard where there was some sort of a workshop. Afterwards, he had added to the wood a thin, smooth piece of iron, which he had also picked up at the same time in the street. Putting the iron, which was a little the smaller than the piece of wood, he fastened them very firmly, crossing and recrossing the thread round them, then wrapped them carefully and daintily in the clean white paper and tied up the parcel so that it would be very difficult to untie it. This was in order to divert the attention of the old woman for a time while she was trying to undo the knot and so to gain a moment. The iron strip was added to give weight so that the woman might not guess the first minute what the thing was made of wood. All this had been stored by him beforehand under the sofa. He had only just got the pledge out when he heard someone suddenly about in the yard. It struck six long ago. Long ago. My God. He rushed to the door, listened, caught up his hat and began to descend his thirteen steps cautiously, noiselessly, like a cat. He had still the most important thing to do, to steal the axe from the kitchen. That the deed must be done with an axe, he had decided long ago. He had also a pocket pruning knife, but he could not rely on the knife, and still less on his own strength, and so resolved finally on the axe. We may note in the passing one peculiarity in regard to all the final resolutions taken by him in the matter, they had one strange characteristic, the more final they were, the more hideous and the more absurd we at once became in his eyes. In spite of all his agonizing inner struggle, he never for a single instant all that time could believe in the carrying out of his plans. And indeed, if it had ever happened that everything to the least point could have been considered and finally settled, and no uncertainty of any kind had remained, he would, it seems, have renounced it all as something absurd, monstrous, and impossible. But a whole mass of unsettled points and uncertainties remain. As for getting the axe, that trifling business caused him no anxiety, for nothing could be easier. Nastasia was continually out of the house, especially in the evenings. She would run into the neighbors or to a shop and always left the door ajar. It was the one thing the landlady was calling her about. And so, when the time came, he could only have to go quietly into the kitchen and to take the axe and an hour later when everything was over go and put it back again. But these were doubtful points. Supposing he returned an hour later to put it back, Anastasia had come back and was on the spot. He would of course have to go by and wait till she went out again. But supposing she were in the meantime to miss the axe, look for it, make an outcry, that would mean suspicion or at least grounds for suspicion. But those were all trifles which he had not even begun to consider, and indeed he had no time. He was thinking of the chief point, and put off trifling details, until he could believe in it all. But that seemed utterly unattainable, so it seemed to himself at least. He could not imagine, for instance, would he, would some time leap off thinking, get up and simply go there. Even his late experiment, that is his visit with the object of the final survey of the place, was simply an attempt at an experiment far from being the real thing as well one should say, come, let us go and try it, why dream about it? 
And at once he had broken down and had run away cursing in the frenzy with himself. Meanwhile, it would seem, as regards the moral question, that his analysis was complete. His casuistry had become keen as a razor, and he could not find rational objections in himself. But in the last resort, he simply ceased to believe in himself and doggedly, slavishly sought arguments in all directions, fumbling for them as though someone were forcing and drawing him to it. At first, long before indeed, he had been much occupied with one question, why almost all crimes are so badly concealed and so easily detected, and why almost all criminals leave such obvious traces. He had come gradually to many different and curious conclusions, and in his opinion the chief reason lay not so much in the material impossibility of concealing the crime as in the criminal himself. Almost every criminal is subject to a failure of will and reasoning power by childish and phenomenal heedlessness at the very instant when prudence and caution are most essential. It was his conviction that this eclipse of reason and failure of will power attacked a man like a disease developed gradually and reached its highest point just before the perpetration of the crime, continued with equal violence at the moment of the crime and for longer or shorter time after, according to the individual case, and then passed off like any other disease. The question whether the disease gives rise to the crime, or whether the crime of its own peculiar nature is always accompanied by something of the nature of disease, he did not yet feel able to decide. When he reached these conclusions, he decided that in his own case, where it could not be such a morbid reaction, that his reason and will would remain unimpaired at the time of carrying out his design, for the simple reason that his design was not a crime. We will omit all the process by means of which he arrived at this last conclusion. We have run too far ahead already. We may add only that the practical, purely material difficulties of that fear occupied a secondary position in his mind. One has but to keep all one's willpower and reason to deal with them, and they will all be overcome at the time when once one has familiarized oneself with the minute's details of the business. But this preparation had never been begun. His final decisions were what he came to trust least, and when the hour struck, it all came to pass quite differently, as it were accidentally and unexpectedly. One trifling circumstance upset his calculations before he had even left the staircase. When he reached the landlady's kitchen, the door of which was open as usual, he glanced cautiously in to see that in Anastasia's absence, the landlady herself was there, or if not, that the door to her own room was closed, so that she might not peep out when he went in for the axe. But what was his amazement when he suddenly saw that Nastasia was not only at home in the kitchen, but was occupied there, taking Clinient out of the basket and hanging it on, on a line. Seeing him, she left on the hanging of the clothes, turned to him, and stared at him all the time he was passing. He turned away his eyes and walked past, as though he noticed nothing. But it was the end of everything, he had not the axe, he was overwhelmed. What made me think? He reflected, as he went under the gateway, what made me think, what she would be sure not to be at home at that moment? Why, why, why did I assume this so suddenly? He was crashed, and even humiliated. 
he could laugh at himself in his anger, and all animal rage boiled within him. He stood hesitating in the gateway to go into the street, to go a walk for appearance sake was revolting, to go back to his room even more revolting. And what a chance I have lost forever, he muttered standing aimlessly in the gateway, just opposite the porter's little dark room, which was also open. Suddenly he started. From the porter's room, two paces away from him, something shining under the bench to the right caught his eye. He looked about him. Nobody. He approached the room on tiptoe, then down two steps into it and in a faint voice called the porter. Yes, not at a home, somewhere near though, in the yard, for the door is wide open. He dashed to the axe, it was an axe, and pulled it out from under the bench, where it lay between two chunks of wood, at once before going out he made it fast in the noose. He thrust both hands into his pockets and went out of the room. No one had noticed him. When a reason fails, the devil helps, he thought with a strained grin. This chance raised his spirits extraordinarily. He walked along quietly and sedately without hurry to avoid awakening suspicion. He scarcely looked at the passers-by tried to escape looking at their faces at all, and to be as little noticeable as possible. Suddenly he thought of his head. Good heavens, I had the money the day before yesterday, and did not get a cap to there instead. A curse rose from the bottom of his soul. Glancing out of the corner of his eye into a shop, he saw by a clock on the wall that it was ten minutes past seven. He had to make haste and at the same time to go some way around, so as to approach the house from the other side. When he happened to imagine all this beforehand, he sometimes thought that he would be very much afraid. But he was not very much afraid now, was not afraid at all indeed. His mind was even occupied by irrelevant matters, but by nothing for long. As he passed the usurp of garden, he was deeply absorbed in considering the building of great fountains and of their refreshing effect on the atmosphere in all the squares. By degrees, he passed to the conviction that if the summer garden were extended to the fields of Mars, and perhaps joined to the garden of the Mikolkovsky Palace, it would be a splendid thing and a great benefit to the town. Then he was interested by the question why in all great towns men are not simply driven by necessity, but in some peculiar way inclined to live in those parts of the town where there are no gardens, no fountains, there there is most dirt and smell and all sorts of nastiness. Then his own works through the haymarket came back to his mind, and for a moment he waked up to reality. What nonsense, he thought. Better think of nothing at all. So probably men led to execution clench mentally at every object that meets them on the way. Flashed to his mind but simply flashed, like lightning he made haste to dismiss this thought. And by now he was near, here was the house, here was the gate. Suddenly a clock somewhere struck once. What? Can it be half past seven? Impossible, it must be fast. Luckily for him, everything went well again at the gate. At that very moment, as though expressly for his benefit, a huge wagon of the hay had just driven in at the gate completely screening him as he passed under the gateway and the wagon had scarcely had time to drive through into the yard before he had slipped in a flash to the right. On the other side of the wagon he could hear shouting and quarreling 
but no one noticed him and no one met him. Many windows looking into that huge quadrangular yard were open at that moment, but he did not raise his head. He had not the strength to. The staircase leading to the old woman's room was close by, just on the right of the gateway. He was already on the stairs. Drawing a breath, pressing his hand against his throbbing heart, and once more feeling for the axe, and setting it straight, he began softly and cautiously ascending the stairs, listening every minute. But the stairs too were quite deserted, all the doors were shut, he met no one. One flat indeed on the third floor was wide open and painters were working it, but they did not glance at him. He stood still, fought a minute and went on. Of course it would be better if they had not been here, but it's two stories above them. And there was the fourth story, here was the door, here was the flat opposite, were empty one, the flat underneath. The old woman's was apparently empty also. The wizarding card nailed on the door had been torn off. They had gone away. He was out of breath. For one instant the thought floated through his mind. Shall I go back? But he made no answer and began listening at the old woman's door, a dead silence. Then he listened again on the staircase listened long and intently, then looked about him for the last time, pulled himself together, drew himself off, and once more tried the axe in the noose. Am I there pale? He wondered, am I not evidently agitated? She is mistrustful, had I better wait a little longer, till my heart leaves off thumping. But his heart did not leave off. On the contrary, as though to spite him, it throbbed more and more violently. He could stand it no longer. He slowly put out his hand to the bell and rang. Half a minute later, he rang again, more loudly. No answer. To go on ringing was useless and out of place. The old woman was, of course, at home, but she was suspicious and alone. He had some knowledge of her habits, and once more he put his ear to the door. Either his senses were peculiar keen, which it is difficult to suppose, or the sound was really very distinct. Anyway, he suddenly heard something like the cautious touch of a hand on the lock and the rustle of the skirt at the very door. Someone was standing stealthily close to the lock and just as he was doing on the outside was secretly listening to the hand and seemed to have her ear to the door. He moved a little on purpose and muttered something aloud that he might not have the appearance of hiding then rang a third time, but quietly, soberly, and without impatience. Recalling it afterwards, that moment stood out in his mind vividly, distinctly, forever. He could not make out how he had had such kerning, for his mind was as it were clouded at moments, and he was almost unconscious of his body. An instant later, he heard the latch and fastened. End of chapter 6, part 1 LibriVox recording All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett. Part 1, Chapter 7 The door was as before, opened a tiny crack, 
and again two sharp and suspicious eyes stared at him out of the darkness. Then Raskolnikov lost his head and nearly made a great mistake. Fearing the old woman would be frightened by their being alone, and not a hoping that the sight of him would disarm her suspicions, he to halt at the door and drew it towards him to prevent the old woman from attempting to shut it again. Seeing this, she did not pull the door back, but she did not let go the handle so that he almost dragged her out with it onto the stairs. Seeing that she was standing in the doorway, not allowing him to pass, he advanced straight upon her. She stepped back in alarm, tried to say something, but seemed unable to speak and stared with open eyes at him. Good evening, Ivana Ivanovna, he began trying to speak easily, but his voice would not obey him. It broke and shook. I have come, I have brought something, but we'd better come in to the light. And leaving her, he passed straight into the room uninvited. The old woman ran after him. Her tongue was unloosed. Good heavens, what it is? Who is it? What do you want? Why, Ilana Ivanovna, you know me. Raskolnikov, here I brought you the pledge I promised the other day and he held out the pledge. The old woman glanced for a moment at the pledge, but at once stared in the eyes of her unwhited visitor. She looked intently, maliciously, and mistrustfully. A minute passed. He even fancied something like a sneer in her eyes, as though she had already guessed everything. He felt that he was losing his head, that he was almost frightened, so frightened that if she were to look like that and not say a word for another half minute, he thought he would have run away from her. Why do you look at me as though you did not know me? He said suddenly, also with malice. Take if you like. If not, I'll go elsewhere. I'm in a hurry. He had not even thought of saying this, but it was suddenly said of itself. The old woman recovered herself, and her visitor's resolute tone restored her confidence. But why, my good sir? All of the minute, what is it? She asked, looking at the pledge. The silver cigarette case. I spoke of it last time, you know. She held out her hand. But how pale you are, to be sure. And your hands are trembling, too. Have you been bathing or what? Fever, he answered abruptly. You can't help getting pale if you've nothing to eat, he added with difficulty, articulating the words. His strength was failing him again, but his answer sounded like the truth. What is it? she asked once more, scanning grass, calling up intently and waving the pledge in her hand. A thing, cigarette case, silver, look at it. It does not seem somehow like silver, how he has wrapped it up. Trying to untie the string and turning to the window to the light, all her windows were shut in spite of the stifling heat. She left him all together for some seconds and stood the, her back to him. He unbuttoned his coat and freed the axe from the noose, but did not yet take it out altogether simply holding it in his right hand under the coat. His hands were fearfully weak. 
He felt them every moment growing more numb and more wooden. He was afraid he would let the axe slip and fall. A sudden giddiness came over him. But what has he tied it up like this for? The old woman cried with vexation and moved towards him. He had not a minute more to lose. He pulled the axe quite out, swung it the both arms, scarcely conscious of himself, and almost without effort, almost mechanically, brought the blunt side down on her head. He seemed not to use his own strength in this, but as soon as he had once brought the axe down, his strength returned to him. The old woman was as always bareheaded. Her thin, light hair, streaked with gray, thickly smeared with grease, was plaited in a red stale and fastened by a broken horn comb which stood out on the nape of her neck. As she was so short, the blow fell on the very top of her skull. She cried out, but very faintly, and suddenly sank all of the heap on the floor, raising her hands to her head. In one hand she still held the pledge. Then he dealt her another and another blow with the blind side and on the same spot. The blood gushed as from an overturned glass, the body fell back. He stepped back, let it fall, and at once bent over her face. She was dead. Her eyes seemed to be starting out of their sockets. The brow and the whole face were drawn and contorted convulsively. He laid the axe on the ground near the dead body and felt it once in her pocket, trying to avoid the streaming body, the same right hand pocket from which she had taken the key on his last visit. He was in full possession of his faculties, free from confusion or giddiness, but his hands were still trembling. He remembered afterwards that he had been particularly collected and careful, trying all the time not to get smeared with the blood. He pulled out the keys at once. They were all as before in one bunch on a steel ring. He ran at once into the bedroom with them. It was a very small room with a whole shrine of holy images. Against the other wall stood a big bed, very clean and covered with a silk patchwork weighted quilt. Against a third wall was a chest of drawers. Strange to say, so soon as he began to fit the keys into the chest, so soon as he heard the jingling, a convulsive shudder passed over him. He suddenly felt tempted again to give it all up and go away. But that was only for an instant. It was too late to go back. He positively smiled at himself. Then suddenly another terrifying idea occurred to his mind. He suddenly fancied that the old woman might be still alive and might recover her senses. Leaving the keys in the chest, he ran back to the body, snatched up the axe and lifted it once more over the old woman, but did not bring it down. There was no doubt that she was dead. Bending down and examining her, Again more closely, he saw clearly that the skull was broken and even battered in on the one side. He was about to feel it with his finger, but drew back his hand, and indeed, it was evident without that. Meanwhile, there was a perfect pool of blood. 
All at once, he noticed a string on her neck. He tugged at it, but the string was strong and did not snap, and besides, it was soaked with blood. He tried to pull it out from the front of the dress, but something held it and prevented its coming. In his impatience, he raised the axe again to cut the string from above on the body, but did not dare, and this difficulty, smearing his hand and the axe in the blood, after two minutes' hard effort, he cut the string and took it off without touching the body with the axe. He was no mistaken. It was a purse. On the string were two crosses, one of cypress wood and one of copper, and an image in silver filigree, and with them a small greasy chamois leather purse with a steel rim and ring. The purse was stuffed very full. Raskolnikov thrust it in his pocket without looking at it flung the crosses on the old woman's body and rushed back into the bedroom, this time taking the axe with him. He was in terrible haste, he snatched the keys and began trying them again, but he was unsuccessful, they would not fit in the locks. It was not so much that his hands were shaking, but that he kept making mistakes, well, he saw, for instance, that the key was not the right one and would not fit. Still, he tried to put it in. Suddenly, he remembered it and realized that the big key, that the deep notches which was hanging there with the small keys could not possibly belong to the chest of drawers. On his last visit, this had struck him, but to some strong box, and that everything, perhaps, was hidden in that box. He left the chest of drawers and at once felt under the bedstead, knowing that all women usually keep boxes under their beds. And so it was. There was a good-sized box under the bed, at least a yard in length, with an arch lid covered with red leather and studded with steel nails. The notch key fitted at once and unlocked it. At the top, under a white sheet, was a coat of red brocade lined with hair skin. Under it was a silk dress, then a shawl, and it seemed as though there was nothing below but clothes. The first thing he did was to wipe his blood-stained hands on the red brocade. It's red, and on red blood will be less noticeable. The food passed through his mind. Then he suddenly came to himself. Good God! I am going out of my senses, he fought with terror. But no sooner he did touch the clothes than a gold watch slipped from under the fur coat. He made haste to turn them all over. They turned out to be various articles made of gold among the clothes, probably all pledges, unredeemed or waiting to be redeemed, bracelets, chains, earrings, pins, and such things. Some were in cases, others simply wrapped in newspaper, carefully and exactly folded, and tied round the tape. Without any delay, he began filling up the pockets of his trousers an overcoat without examining or undoing the parcels and cases, but he had not time to take many. He suddenly heard steps in the room where the old woman lay. He stopped short and was still as death, but all was quiet, so it must have been his fancy. 
all at once he heard distinctly a faint cry, as though someone had uttered a low broken moan. Then again, dead silence for a minute or two. He sat squatting on his heels by the box and waited holding his breath. Suddenly he jumped up, seized the axe and ran out of the bedroom. In the middle of the room stood Elizaveta with the big bundle in her arms. She was gazing in stupefaction at her murdered sister, white as a sheet and seeming not to have the strength to cry out. Seeing him run out of the bedroom, she began faintly quivering all over like a leaf. A shudder ran down her face. She lifted her hand, opened her mouth, but still did not scream. She began slowly backing away from him into the corner, staring intently, persistently at him, but still uttered no sound, as though she could not get breath to scream. He rushed at her with the axe. Her mouth twitched piteously as one sees babies' mouths when they begin to be frightened, stared intently at what frightens them and are on the point of screaming. And this hapless Lizaveta was so simple and had been so thoroughly crushed and scared that she did not even raise a hand to guard her face, though that was the most necessary and natural action at the moment, for the axe was raised over her face. She only put up her empty left hand, but not to her face, slowly holding it out before her as though motioning him away. The axe fell with the sharp edge just on the skull and split at one blow all the top of the head. She fell heavily at once. Raskolnikov completely lost his head, snatching up her bundle, dropped it again, and ran into the entry. Fear gained more and more mastery over him, especially after this second, quite unexpected murder. He longed to run away from place as fast as possible, and if at that moment he had been capable of seeing and reasoning more correctly, if he had been able to realize all the difficulties of his position, the hopelessness, the hiddenness, and the absurdity of it, if he could have understood how many obstacles and perhaps crimes he had still to overcome or to commit to get out of that place and to make his way home, it is very possible that he would have flung up everything and would have gone to give himself up, and not from fear, but from simple horror and loathing of what he had done. The feeling of loathing especially surged up in him and grew stronger every minute. He would not now have gone to the box or even into the room for anything in the world. But a certain blankness, even dreaminess, had begun by degrees to take possession of him. At moments he forgot himself, or rather forgot what was of importance, and caught at trifles. Glancing, however, into the kitchen and seeing a bucket half full of water on a bench, he bethought him of washing his hands and the axe. His hands were sticky with blood. He dropped the axe with the blade in the water, snatched a piece of soap that lay in a broken saucer on the window, and began washing his hands in the pocket. While they were clean, he took off the axe, washed the blade, and spent a long time, about three minutes, washing the wood, where there were spots of blood rubbing them with soap. Then he wiped it all with some linen that was hanging to dry on a line in the kitchen, and then he was a long while 
attentively examining the axe at the window. There was no trace left on it, only the wood was still damp. He carefully hung the axe and the noose under his coat. Then, as far as was possible, in the dim light in the kitchen, he looked over his overcoat, his trousers, and his boots. At the first glance, there seemed to be nothing but stains on the boots. He wetted the rag and rubbed the boots. But he knew he was not looking thoroughly that there might be something quite noticeable what he was overlooking. He stood in the middle of the room, lost in food. Dark, agonizing ideas rose in his mind. The idea that he was mad, and that at that moment he was incapable of reasoning, of protecting himself, that he ought perhaps to be doing something utterly different from what he was now doing. Good God, he muttered. I must fly, fly, and he rushed into the entry, but here a shock of terror awaited him, such as he had never known before. He stood and gazed, and could not believe his eyes. The door, the outer door from the stairs, at which he had not long before waited and rung, was standing unfastened and at least six inches open, no lock, no bolt, all the time, all that time. The old woman had not shot it after him, perhaps, as a precaution. But good God, why he had seen Lizaveta afterwards, and how could he, how could he have failed to reflect that she must have come and somehow she could not have come to the wall? He dashed to the door and fastened the latch. But no, the wrong thing again. I must get away, get away. He unfastened the latch, opened the door, and began listening on the staircase. He listened a long time. Somewhere far away, it might be in the gateway, two voices were loudly and shrilly shouting, quarreling, and scolding. Where are they about? He waited patiently. At last all was still, as though suddenly cut off, the head separated. He was meaning to go out, but suddenly, on the floor below, a door was noisily opened and someone began going downstairs, humming a tune. How is it we all make such a noise? flashed to his mind. Once more he closed the door and waited. At last all was still, not a soul staring. He was just taking a step towards the stairs when he heard fresh footsteps. The steps sounded very far off, at the very bottom of the stairs, but he remembered quite clearly and distinctly that from the first sound he began for some reason to suspect that this was someone coming there, to the fourth floor, to the old woman. Why? Though the sound somehow peculiar, significant, the steps were heavy, even and unhurried. Now he had passed the first floor, now he was mounting higher, it was growing more and more distinct. He could hear his heavy breathing. And now the third story had been reached, coming here, and it seemed to him all at once that he was turned to stone, that it was like a dream in which one is being pursued, nearly caught, and will be killed, and it's rooted to the spot, and cannot even move one's arms. At last, when the unknown was mounting to the fourth floor, he suddenly started and succeeded in slipping neatly and quickly back into the flat and closing the door behind him. Then he took the hook and softly, noiselessly fixed it in the catch. Instinct helped him. 
When he had done this, he cried, holding his breath by the door. The unknown visitor was by now also at the door. They were now standing opposite one another, as he had just before been standing with the old woman when the door divided them, and he was listening. The visitor panted several times. He must be a big fat man, thought Raskolnikov, squeezing the axe in his hand. It seemed like a dream indeed. The visitor took hold of the bell and rang it loudly. As soon as the tin bell tinkled, Raskolnikov seemed to be aware of something moving in the room. For some seconds he listened quite seriously. The unknown rang again, waited, and suddenly tugged violently and impatiently at the handle of the door. Raskolnikov gazed in horror at the hook shaking in its fastening, and in blank terror expected every minute that the fastening would be pulled out. It certainly did seem possible, so violently was he shaking it. He was tempted to halt the fastening, but he might be aware of it. A giddiness came over him again. I shall fall down, flashed through his mind, but the unknown began to speak, and he recovered himself at once. What's up? Are they asleep or murderer? Damn them! He bawled in a thick voice. Hey, Elena Ivanovna, old witch, Elizaveta Ivanovna, hey, my beauty, open the door! Oh, damn them! Are they asleep or what? And again, in rage, he tucked with all his might a dozen times at the bell. He must certainly be a man of authority and an intimate acquaintance. At this moment, light hard steps were heard not far off. On the stairs, someone else was approaching. Raskolnikov had not heard them at first. You don't say there is no one at home, the newcomer cried in a cheerful ringing voice, addressing the first visitor who still went on pulling the bell. Good evening, Koch. From his voice he must be quite young, full Raskolnikov. Who the devil can tell? I've almost broken the lock, answered Koch. But how do you come to know me? Why, the day before yesterday I beat you three times running at billiards at Gambrinus. Ah, oh, so they are not at home. That's queer. It's awfully stupid, woe. Where could the old woman have gone? I've come on business. Yes, and I have business of her, too. Well, what can we do? Go back, I suppose, huh? And I was hoping to get some money, cried the young man. We must give it up, of course, but what did she fix this time for? The old witch fixed the time for me to come herself. It's out of my way. And where the devil she can have got to? I can't make out. She sits here from year's end to year's end. The old hag. Her legs are bad and yet here, all of a sudden she's out for a walk. Hadn't be better ask the porter. What? Where she's gone and when she'll be back. Hmm, damn it all, we might ask. But you know, she never does go anywhere. And he once more tucked at the door handle. Damned it all, there is nothing to be done, we must go. Stay, cried the young man suddenly. Do you see how the door shakes if you pull it? Well, that shows. It's not locked, but fastened with the hook. Do you hear how the hook clangs? Well, why? Don't you see? That proves that one of them is at home. If they were all out, 
we would have locked the door from the outside with the key and not with the hook from inside. There do you hear how the hook is clanking? To fasten the hook on the inside they must be at home, don't you see? So there they are sitting inside and don't open the door. Well, and so they must be cried cock astonished. Where are they about in there? And he began furiously shaking the door. Stay, cried the young man again. Don't pull it, Ed. There must be something wrong. Here you've been ringing and pulling at the door, and still they don't open. So either they both fainted or what? I tell you what. Let's go fetch the porter. Let him wake them up. All right. Both were going down. Stay, you stop here while I run down for the porter. What for? Well, you'd better. All right. I'm studying the law, you see. It's evident. Evident there is something wrong here. The young man cried hotly, and he ran downstairs. Kaha remained. Once more, he softly touched the bell, which gave one tinkle. Then gently, as though reflecting and looking about him, began touching the door handle, pulling it and letting it go to make sure once more where it was only fastened by the hook. Then, puffing and panting, he bent down and began looking at the keyhole, but the key was in the lock on the inside and so nothing could be seen. Raskolnikov stood keeping tight hold of the axe. He was in sort of delirium. He was even making ready to fight when they should come in. While they were knocking and talking together, the idea several times occurred to him to end it all at once and shout to them to the door. Now and then he was tempted to swear them, to jeer them, while they could not open the door, only made haste, with the fourth that flashed to his mind. But what the devil is he about? Time was passing, one minute and another, no one came. Koch began to be restless. What the devil, he cried suddenly, and in patience deserting his sentry duty, he too went down, hurrying and thumping with his heavy boots on the stairs. The steps died away. Good heavens, what am I to do? Raskolnikov unfastened the hook, opened the door, there was no sound. Abruptly, without any thought at all, he went out, closing the door as thoroughly as he could, and went downstairs. He had gone down three flights when he suddenly heard a loud voice below. Where could he go? There was nowhere to hide. He was just going back to the flat. Hey there, catch the brute! Somebody dashed out of a flat below, shouting in rather felt, then ran down the stairs, bawling at the top of his voice, Mitchka! 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 Blast him! The shout ended in a shriek. The last sounds came from the yard. All was still. But at the same instant, several men talking loud and fast began noisily mounting the stairs. There were three or four of them. He distinguished the ringing voice of the young man. They. Filled with despair, he went straight to meet them, feeling come what must. If they stop him, all was lost. If they let him pass, all was lost too. They would remember him. They were approaching. They were only a flight from him. And suddenly, deliverance. 
A few steps from him on the right, there was an empty flat with the door wide open. The flat on the second floor, where the painters had been at work, and which, as though for his benefit, they had just left. It was they, no doubt, who had just run down shouting. The floor had only just been painted. In the middle of the room stood a pail and a broken pot with paint and brushes. In one instant he had whisked in at the open door and hidden behind the wall, and only in the nick of time they had already reached the landing. When they turned and went on up to the fourth floor, talking loudly, he waited, went out on a tip-tie, and ran down the stairs. No one was on the stairs, nor in the gateway. He passed quickly to the gateway and turned to the left in the street. He knew perfectly well that at that moment they were at the flat. They were greatly astonished at finding it unlocked, as the door had just been fastened. But by now they were looking at the bodies. That before another minute had passed, they would guess and completely realize that the murderer had just been there and had succeeded in hiding somewhere, slipping by them and escaping. They would guess, most likely, that he had been in the empty flat while they were going upstairs, and meanwhile he dare not quicken his pace much, though the next turning was still nearly a hundred yards away. Should he slip through some gateway and wait somewhere in an unknown street? No, hopeless. Should he fling away the axe? Should he take a cab? Hopeless, hopeless. At last he reached the turning, he turned down in it more dead than alive. Here he was, halfway to safety, and he understood it. It was less risky because there was a great crowd of people and he was lost in it like a grain of sand. But all he had suffered had so weakened him that he could scarcely move. Perspiration ran down him in drops. His neck was all wet. My word, he has been going it, someone shouted at him when he came out on the canal bank. He was only dimly conscious of himself now, and the farther he went, the worse it was. He remembered, however, that on coming out into the canal bank, he was alarmed at finding few people there, and so being more conspicuous, and he had thought of turning back. Though he was almost falling from fatigue, he went a long way round so as to get home from quite a different direction. He was not fully conscious when he passed through the gateway of his house. He was already on the staircase before he recollected the axe, and yet he had a very grave problem before him, to put it back and to escape observation as far as possible in doing so. He was, of course, incapable of reflecting would it might perhaps be far better not to restore the axe at all, but to drop it later on in somebody's yard. But it all happened fortunately. The door of the porter's room was closed but not locked, so that it seemed most likely that the porter was at a home. But he had so completely lost all power of reflection that he walked straight to the door and opened it. If the porter had asked him, what do you want, he would perhaps have simply handed him the axe. But again, the porter was not at home, and he succeeded in putting the axe back under the bench, and even covering it with a chunk of wood as before. He met no one, not a soul, afterwards on the way to his room. The landlady's door was shut. When he was in his room, he flung himself on the sofa, just as he was. 
he did not sleep, but sank into the blank forgetfulness. If anyone had come into his room then, he would have jumped up at once and screamed. Scraps and shreds of food were simply swooning in his brain, but he could not catch at one. He could not rest on one, in spite of all his efforts. End of part one.